Well, you've just heard from Ron Melnick a great deal of the evidence which now exists in terms of animal studies. What I intend to do is to supplement what he has said with some more details over the human studies. As Ron said, you cannot do an experiment on humans. What we essentially do is to observe what has happened and work out, as far as we are able, the causes of this. And we do this by asking people questions, by collecting data on terms of the extent to which people use cell phones and so on. As Ron has just pointed out to you, the International Agency for Research on Cancer had a working group review in 2011. And what they did was to look, as they always do, at cancer in humans, cancer in animals, as well as, increasingly, the mechanisms for the action, which subsequent sp speakers, including my colleague, Dr. Paul Haru, will be commenting upon later. They concluded that there is limited evidence in humans for the carcinogenicity of radiofrequency radiation. And this was because there had been noted several positive associations observed between exposure to radiofrequency radiation from wireless phones and glioma and acoustic ne neuroma. Glioma is the most malignant form of brain cancer and acoustic neuroma is the cancer which occurs around the hearing nerve, the vestibular nerve. And the al alternative term for that is vestibular schwannoma. We heard about schwannomas in experimental animals. We also get schwannomas in humans from this exposure. The ARC at that time concluded that there was limited evidence in experimental animals. But now we've got very strong evidence, as we heard. And they concluded that radio frequency electromagnetic fields are possibly carcinogenic to humans. <coughs> They're group 2B. We now, I'm going to try and answer the question, why do we now believe that radio frequency radiation in fact causes brain cancer in humans? Not that there is limited evidence, but there is sufficient evidence. And this is largely based on three important sets of case control, i.e. human studies, of mobile phone use and brain cancer. A case control study, you identify cases of the disease you're concerned about. The controls are people living in the same community but who have not developed the disease and you compare their exposure. And there were three important studies of this type. An international study which was called Interphone and they reported a twofold increased risk of glioma after 10 or more years use of mobile phones. In Sweden, one of the first countries to introduce this technology, so they've had people exposed for much longer than in other countries, including the US and Canada. There have been several studies showing a two to five fold increased risk of glioma after prolonged use, especially when exposure began, began early in life, the age of 10 or even earlier. And then more recently, there has been a study in France, which goes by the name Serenat. This is a very important study. France uh, has a whole series of epidemiologists. It doesn't often come up with these studies, but this was a very good study. And they found a five-fold increased risk of glioma after five or more years of use. All these studies showed that the lower the exposure, the less the risk. Interestingly, there is evidence that radio frequency radiation is probably an avoidable cause of breast cancer. And this has been based on some unusual case reports which has also been supported, which I'm not going to go into this afternoon, exposure modeling and toxicology. 
This was the first case reported by Robert Nagumi in 2009. It was invasive multiple primary tumors in a 34-year-old. This is the bright spots you see on that mammogram. This woman was an avid runner, a Chinese-American woman who had kept a cell phone four hours a day in her bra for 10 years. And then Wes from California reported four cases. This is just one of them, a 21-year-old, very young for breast cancer. This unusual cancer, yeah, I don't know if you can see the mammogram clearly, but on the outside of the right breast, you see all those spots of cancer, multifocal as we call it, in fact mirroring the antennae of the cell phone which this woman kept in her bra. In Israel, there have been, they have pointed out that there have been a number of cases of tumors of the salivary gland. They have tripled in Israel. In fact, one in, in five under age 20 of these cases. And you can see that the, where the salivary glands are, the parotid gland, sublingual gland, and submandibular gland. And this is where the cell phone is normally held close to those glands. And this is a graph showing the increase in parotid gland tumors that have occurred in Israel over the last 30 years. It's interesting that this should be in Israel. Israel has done, there have been a number of studies done in Israel of radiofrequency radiation, uh, some of it related to uh, uh, soldiers who were exposed to radar with multiple cancers, particularly, expo uh, particularly increased in risk. One of the things that people often say to me is that it's all very well for you to say this, but there hasn't been reports of increases in these cancers in the various countries where the studies have been done. Well, this is wrong. Phillips and his colleagues of this year reported this increase in the most severe form of glioma, glioma 4, glioblastoma multiforme, the red line going up with time in the United Kingdom. And these tumors are the ones where you would expect the maximum exposure from cell phone use in the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe of the brain. And that's very important. Other brain regions don't show the increase, but where you would, ex would get the maximum exposure, then the increase has occurred. And also, there have been other reported changes in rates of brain cancer. The incidence of neuroepithelial brain cancers, which includes glioblastoma multiforme, has in significantly increased in children, adolescents, and young adults from birth to 24 years in the United States. And there have now been two studies reporting this, initially by Gittleman and more recently by Siegel, and he uh, and his colleagues come from the environmental, um, what's it called, the environmental? CDC, CDC yeah, thank you. Sorry. I didn't, I thought there was a conclusion. We seem to have lost the conclusion. <laughs> Hold it up. No, we don't seem to. Anyway, my conclusion is, as a result of what the evidence I've shown you, that if the international agency were to reconvene a working group to reevaluate radio frequency radiation, they would be bound to conclude with the human evidence we've got, the animal evidence that Dr. Melnick has talked about, and the mechanistic evidence that Dr. Haru will tell us shortly, that this exposure is a human carcinogen. And governments could not ignore that. They would have to change the exposure, allowable exposure limits to reduce the exposure to as low as reasonably achievable.
something we learned to do many years ago for ionizing radiation x-rays. You no longer see the, the, the x-ray machines where you can look down and see your feet in a shoe, in a shoe store. Because we learned that was wrong, and x-rays in pregnancy are cut down to avoid leukemia in children. All this evidence came and we acted. We've now got the evidence for radiofrequency radiation, and we must act. Thank you for your attention.